Matthew, the 20th chapter. I saw, uh, uh, you know, they, they throw these memes on social media, and it showed four people in a church, and it said, Would you, could you preach as if there were 200 here in a church of four? And I thought, I do that all, every midweek. Yeah. Amen. I don't care how many show up, I'm going to preach the same. And sometimes the midweeks are better than the Sundays. Amen. I just enjoy preaching and teaching the Word and bringing it out and, uh, as, we, as we move into this month and, and all the things that are going to go on. I'm really excited about Bishop Gary McIntosh being with us. He's one of my favorites, and he always comes. You know, he's, he's retired now. He, he turned the church over, and the church is exploding. He built a foundation, and it had probably 800,000 in it. Now it's even got more than that, so uh, he's booked for the rest of the month. It's the only time I could get him, so if, I said, if you can come, we'd love to have you in. A little spring conference here, a little pre-spring, I guess you'd call it. But I was just, uh, the, the thought I was just thinking, you know, what, what we need to learn and hope to know in life is what I call big picture thinking. Start seeing the bigger picture, seeing the world beyond our own needs and how that leads to great ideas. Well, whenever I talk with people about this, I, I, I bring up thinking eternal. That you have to think eternal. This is not all there is. You've got to see the big picture. And a lot of times in life, everything gets narrow real quick. When you're going through dilemmas and problems and physical uh, issues in your body or emotional, it gets real small real quick, David. So you've got you to start thinking eternal. You've got to get the big picture. Next is focus thinking, learning how to focus. So after you get this big one, you also got to focus, which also kind of narrows things down. It's almost like I'm, I'm giving you an oxymoron here. So I didn't call you nothing. I just used a name, that, uh, a word that I used. But focus thinking is removing mental clutter and distractions to, to realize your full potential. That, that you start thinking during the day, okay, what is it I need to get? it done how is it i need to get it done and you start focusing on that and taking out and we get bombarded with so many things now that are coming in and trying to take away our attention and take away our thinking and then with creative thinking is stepping out of the boat and making breakthroughs creative thinking to me i love being around creative people i don't uh, i don't care if it's in the kitchen you know some of the best meals were mistakes where people were creative. Don't tell me that a casserole was something that somebody invented. That, they just threw some, some scraps in there, and it just made that good. Or if you've ever been to England, I have. If you ever ate a meat pie before, oh, my goodness, you know that had to be a mistake to start with. And then, and then they threw that all together, especially if they get the, the liver and stuff in it. It's just not good. But bottom line is I love creative thinking. And I watched a man trying to load, unload something off of a truck, and, and, and he, he boomed out on the uh, uh, what do we call that thing? Uh, uh, for, it's like, not, like, not a fork, a track hole. He boomed out, he, he, and, he, and he trying to pick culverts up, and he couldn't do it. So he went and told the guys, grab some logs. They grabbed logs, threw it down in front of the track hole. He drove up on it, and that gave him an extra two foot so he could pick them up and set them off. And I thought, whoa, I mean, just that kind of creative thinking. Church has to be that way, too. Be, be more creative. I talked to my son the other day, and one of the things is, how are you going to reach this generation? And he said, Dad, I'm going to just tell you, you're going to have to use your phone. He said, you're going to have to. And I said, well, I have friends that are doing that, Judah. He said, well, it, you're not, it's not that you're following your friends. You just got to understand this. We like little clips, and, and they watch it all the time. Let's talk at YouTube. He said, you got to get on there. And I said, it's giving me some ideas to think about. Okay, how would I do this? Because i got friends that do Monday matters and, and, and sermon in a truck and, and a, a message in a moment, in a minute. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I mean, i got to get creative. So I thought, oh, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get my motorcycle, and I'm going to get on it. I'm going to crank it up, and I'm going to get the guys with a fan blowing a fan on me. And, I, and I, I'm going to have, you know, uh, the, the Bible on a bike. And, I, and, the, and I'm going to act like I'm riding, and I'll, I'll be standing still with the wind blowing on me, and I'm going to share the gospel for a few minutes on the bike. I think that would work. Just thinking of ideas outside the box here. Again, this is right. This is thinking. It's creative thinking. I'm trying to think of something a little bit different than maybe what others are doing. And then shared thinking is working with others to compound results. In other words, you share your thought with somebody else, and you just you're thinking. And this is this is probably the best thing. It's, it's teamwork. I've often expressed that the word team is together, experience in the ministry. It ain't just me. It ain't big eyes and little use. It's everybody together sharing in ideas. And how are we going to do this thing? Uh, <laughs> I. I, what was it Ken Holloway asked me? He asked me, he said, what time's the Valentine banquet? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Does anybody know? It's 5 o'clock. Okay. I don't know. I said, Ken, I'm dealing with tonight and tomorrow night, and when Sunday, by the time the weekend gets here, I'll figure out what time it is. But I really don't know what time it is. I hadn't checked, hadn't looked, signed up for it, but don't know what time. You know, I don't know why I throw that in. I guess maybe I need somebody to help think with me. It helped me out. So you got to embrace good thinking. 
And, and here's our thing, and Cheryl, I saw you, you post a, a stinking thinking. I've, I've used that phrase a lot, you've got to quit your stinking thinking, because our, our thinking has to adjust. When you got born again, God wants to take care of your brain, too. He wants you to start thinking different. And if you start thinking different, you start acting different. Good thinking creates the foundation for good results. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. Let me say that to you again. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. On the contrary, bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results. Every now and then, you'll hear somebody thinking bad, and you know it's bad, and, and you're liable if you don't say something. Hello? You can't let them just keep thinking bad things. you gotta, you got to help them out at that moment. Nothing can come from watermelons but watermelons. Nothing comes from weeds but weeds. And this is a natural law, but few of us understand it, it, it when it goes into the mental and the moral world. We understand sowing. We understand reaping. But what about the way we think so we don't cooperate with it? One of the reasons people don't achieve their dreams is that they desire to change their results without changing their thinking. It ain't going to work. you got to change the way you think. You got to say, okay, I get this thinking, and it's important. Good thinking increases your potential. Proverbs 23, 7 says, a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if I can convince you to think different about yourself, you'll start acting different. But you got to be convinced. That's why I'm always telling you, you are a child of God. You're a son and a daughter of God, of the king. When you start thinking that way, your head gets, you, you lift up. That thinking eternal thing, what do you think? The kingdom of God is not for God. It's for us. Amen. God has established a place for us in the hereafter that we can, uh, and who knows what he's going to have us do. But I think somehow our brain is connected to that. How we think, our memories, and, and the things that, you know, uh, getting rid of the past, moving toward the for, uh, future. And if you're thinking, shapes who you are, then it naturally follows that your potential is determined by your thinking. How much potential do you have, still have that you've not used? And you got to think about it. I, 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 can, I can work this thing. Progress is often a good idea away. If I could just have a good idea. I, and I can tell you this. You, you, you may be one good idea away from financial breakthrough. You may be one good idea away from uh, health. You know, one of the things I, I'm learning, and we'll, we'll well, I'm going to jump ahead. I can't jump ahead. But I know, I know this. If you take fleas, you've had fleas, and you put them in a jar, and you put a lid on it, the fleas will jump to try to get out. And they'll bump their head on the lid. And they'll keep bumping their head on the lid. And then you take the lid off, and that flea will stay in the jar because it don't want to jump any higher than when it hit its head on the lid. And a lot of us have done that in life. We've hit our head relationally and said, well, it ain't going to get no better than this, and it can. Well, it can't get no better financially, and it can. Amen. The lid's been off long. When, God, when you got born again, the lid came off. Amen. When the lid came off, you can get on out the jar and quit staying in there with the other fleas. Can I get an amen? So be, beware when the great God of the holy wild lets loose a great thinker on this planet. I'm telling you, it's something else. I was taught coming up, you had to be fair. And this is what I find with Jesus. He's always challenging your thinking. And I would read the Bible, and I would literally back up and stare at it again, saying, now that goes against everything I was taught. You've got to be fair. You know, uh, you, work, you go work for a plant. You know, you start at a certain amount of money, and, and people get upset. And now I'm reading this proverb again, and I'm thinking to myself, this parable, and I'm saying to myself, Jesus, he really threw fairness out the door. And, and this is hard for us because as Americans, we like for things to be fair. We want it to be fair. Let me just say this to you. My truck's faster than your truck. That ain't fair. Hello? What if, it, what if fairness was across the board? And it didn't matter what we drove, they're only going 35 mile an hour. I, that's exactly right. I would want to get outside the box and figure out how to take the governor off the thing to make it go faster. Amen. I'd want to do that. You see what I mean? So, so life is it's not, it doesn't have to be fair. It's not that life ain't fair. It doesn't have to be fair. It does. Watch this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed that vineyards, it could be hoeing and, and, and taking away the weeds. It could pick picking the grapes. But he, they're doing something in the vineyard. He agreed to pay them, uh, let's just make, break it down, a dollar for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also can go to work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour 
and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. So it evidently there was a press on. He was being kind, hiring people, but there was a press on to get some things done. Then when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. Now watch this. He said, when you pay them, I want to find this again. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. So the one that worked the hour, pay them first. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the, the kicker. You and I would have done this. We would have done this. We would have paid the ones that went out first. Give them their money and let them get on. Right? But instead, they paid the one that only worked the hour first. And so the ones that worked all day saw the one that got paid the hour first. So if he saw them get the dollar, in their mind, they're thinking, well, if he got a dollar for, for one hour of work, and I've been out here for 11 hours, surely I'm going to get $11. But that ain't what the owner said when he hired him, right? He said, if you work for me, I'll give you a dollar. Okay, all right. Because no one is hired. Uh, let's see, let's get down to 8 verse 9. Uh, the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a dollar. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a dollar. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and, and, and have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Verse 13, but he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a dollar? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want? You can tell this is not a union. <laughs> uh, okay. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Now let me pull this away from money and talk to you a minute. This is church life. Because I've seen it 26 years now pastoring where people have got in on the ground work. They painted that wall. They built these walls back here in the back. They put the, 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 the sealer text up. They put the curtain in the back. They, they did all the paint, did all this pretty woodwork right here. All this was not here when you got here. Not, some of you were never here when it got, but so I know the man that put up most of this in and did the work. Not here tonight. Normally he's always here, but I'm going to tell you something. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something then all of a sudden people start showing up who never done any of this? They only were like Jim, just got up here and played the drums. And they're not even his drums. And you say to yourself, well, hold on. How do they get to do all And we did all the work in that church, and they're coming in and reaping all the benefits? Are you, are you following where I'm going? So this is what we got to be careful of. We can't get that spirit on us where we start saying, well, that's just not fair. That just ain't right. Because in my life, I'm standing here, I'm pushing for the 11th hour. This, we may only have an hour left on this earth. We don't know how much time we got. So the issue is get people in and not be upset with those who have uh, who've done all the work. And then they get mad because, uh, again, it's that Martha thing. You got to be careful with it. Amen. Because it can get hold of you. And you got to want them to, be, to come in. You got to, it's the same way out at the ranch. You know, I, I meet people go, well, man. I did all this. I mowed this grass. I did this work. Look at these people coming in here and acting like they own this place. And I say they do. We invited them in too. They have just as much right to be here. And so when, the, when, when Jesus is saying this, he's telling them there's a difference in justice and fairness. Uh, my friend, justice is impartial in acting, merited, based on sound reason. Versus fairness. Fairness is fairyland. It's imaginary. I once somebody told me that, that a fair is a place where the Ferris wheels and monkey poop. And I, and I agree with that. Amen. That's, that's what fair is. And a lot of times we say, well, life ain't fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. But it is just. Amen. And I, so when I read what Jesus said, I say, okay, I, I take that. Because I'm one of those that may have got in a little bit last in the, in the very beginning. I've been at it for 30-something years now. But I learned this enough to realize that if I think right, if I think right, and, and, and I, I probably would be the guy. I probably would still give the guys that worked all day first a dollar so they wouldn't see what I did to the other. But, and it, it will trip me up at times because I'm, I, I try not to be, I, I try to be just with, with the people that I got around me. 
But I, I know they, that, that their, their work ethics and what they do and uh, the people that I see in the church, uh, sometimes God just tells me, do something, I'll just do it. I don't know much about that person. But then there are other times it, it has nothing to do with, with fairness. I can't be fair. It's the same way with our kids. You can't be fair with your kids. You know that. Amen. Your kids are all a different size, different time. Amen. And uh, we've talked about this before. Jesus was constantly through parables and life stories challenging the disciples and religious leaders thinking. He wanted to challenge their thinking. Because if you can start thinking right, if you can start using your mind right, you, you can shift your whole day. You've heard me say for years, my day was good. Whose fault was it? My fault. Amen. I've made this a good day. I don't have to allow things to destroy. And, and again, well, if I can't change it, I, I don't have to let it change me. So I'm going to make this day my best day. Let me ask you a question. Who am I? I'm your constant companion. I'm your greatest helper or, or heaviest burden. I will push you forward or drag you downward to failure. I am completely at your command. Half of the things you do, you might just as well turn over to me, and I'll be able to do them quickly and correctly. I'm easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. I am the servant of all great men, alas, of all great failures as well. Those who are great, I've made them great. Those who are failures, well, I made them failures. I'm not a machine, though I'll work with all precision of a machine, plus the intelligence of a man. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I'll destroy you. Who am I? I'm habit. I'm habit. I'm habit. And your mind gets adjusted to habits, to doing things. Good thinking produces more good thinking. Think about that. Good thinking. You make it a habit. Right now, I'm trying to make riding a bicycle a habit. It's not as easy as it looked. I got 24 hours in a day. All I need is 6 to 10 minutes on that bike. Why can't I find 6 to 10 minutes on that bike? All I got to do is get on that bike and pedal that bike. My wife bought that bike for me for my birthday. I get on that, and I think to myself, if I can ride this bike, I can lose this belly. If I can ride this bike, I, I, can, I can strengthen these legs that have been struggling for you. All I got to do is ride this bike. And I'll get on that bike, and I'll ride it, and, and I've made it every day. I've missed one day that I can that I remember. But I'm trying to make it a habit. And I know it's going to take me about three weeks to get into a real good habit of riding that bicycle. But I've done it before. This is one thing I know about habit. I've had a habit of riding a bike before, and it helped me a lot. I just got to get back in the habit of it. Habits are a hard thing to get into, isn't it? Amen. If I can get in the right habit. Bad habits, boy, they're easy. Oh, especially if it starts with chocolate. Man, those habits, they're so easy. They're easy to get on that, on that train. But, man, to get on that and start working this thing out again and getting my, and my, and I, I saw a picture of me the other day on my motorcycle, and I could tell, hey, Ian, you're looking better. You're getting better. So I got to stay at it. Habit's going to make me stay better. And I got to do like some of y'all. You know, I got to take selfies of myself in the mirror. <laughs> Not you, Ken? Uh-uh, okay, I understand that. I saw that. I saw you lift your shirt the other day when you pulled up. I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> I miss. I'm trying to do good. I know you're doing good. You're good. Somebody wants a six pack. Others of us have kegs. Amen. <laughs> See, guys, practice doesn't make perfect if you're practicing wrong. Well, I learned that a lot. I used to hear it all the time. Practice makes perfect. It don't. When I played golf, is that right? If you're playing golf, if you practice wrong, you're always going to be wrong. Amen. You just, you got to learn to practice right. Same way with serving God, to keep practicing the correct way. Good thinking produces more good thinking if you're thinking right. Making good thinking a habit. Success comes to those who habitually do things that unsuccessful people won't do. You know, my, uh, before I left the house, Lori was putting up blind, uh, blinds. I, we had a guy in our church, great guy, I love this guy. He came over, he said, you know what, it's too dark in front of your house, Pastor. I want to put up some lights. I said, good, go ahead. And uh, so he strung up some lights. What up? I mean, it's like daylight at my house now. It just shines out. And Judah comes out of the bedroom. He's going, Dad, 
I can't. Jill's the same way. I can't sleep. It's so bright in the bedrooms. You know, it's like nighttime. I mean, daytime. And it reminds me of Seinfeld when Kramer uh, had the, had the light, chicken light going off in front of his 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 bedroom, and he couldn't sleep all night. A uh, uh, Kenny Rogers chicken. That's what he was. It was flashing. He drove him nuts. And if you watched the show, you know how Kramer was. Well, that's how my kids feel now. So this guy's he got them lights. So what do you do? I got a darkened room. So she's gone in and she's darkened the rooms. She's putting these dark curtains up, and I'm going, and I was helping her for a left I said, oh, that's nice. She said, you think you're going to be able to sleep, uh, sleep, uh, sleep late when he's like this? I said, I can't. I got too much to do every day. I, got to, I don't care how dark this room is. I got to get up in the morning. I can't stay in. But, boy, you're talking about a little temptation now. <laughs> Them dark rooms. Listen, guys, achievement comes from the habit of good thinking. An invasion of armies. Uh, Victor Hugo said this, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an invasion of ideas. And wh what I'm seeing is I've seen a lot of bad ideas in Congress right now. Bad ideas. And it's like the bad ideas are hanging out with the bad ideas. And, they, and they're, not, they're not catching it. So I think it's important that we keep thinking right, keep saying things the right way. You know, habits often are a good thing. And God gave us the capacity to form habits. I mean, he gave you a brain that if you repeat things over and over, it'll start doing those things over and over. Walking became a part of a habit in your life. You watch a kid learn to walk. They haven't picked it up yet. But once they figure it out, they got it down. It's a habit with it. You, you, you figure in. in some of us have unconscious habits and don't even realize it at times. You know, we don't. So we have to pay attention or maybe have somebody help us with our blind spots. Habits, again, are a good thing. God gave us the capacity to form habits, thereby having, allowing us to be multitasking. And I can say this. Women are better at this than men. Women can multitask. Man, they can cook, feed the baby, change the channel. I mean, all just a boom, boom, boom. Men, we're kind of focused when it comes to stuff, it's hard for us to kind of break free from, from one thing at a time. But God gives us that uh, ability. Listen, guys, habits, habits, are, you can have good ones. But listen, there are not so good habits as well. And Satan understands that. And he can trap us in destructive ones. And then he'll win too. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. If he finds us uh, in bad habits, that's when destruction comes in our own life. Do you struggle with a habit? I do. I, I have habits I, that, you know, I'm still working on, you know, 30-something years. You still do. Don't ask me what they are, you nosy thing. <laughs> I ain't asking you what yours are. But listen to me. All of us struggle with certain habits. We got, we got things, things that kind of control our thoughts. You determine to break free, but find yourself right back doing the same things, thinking the same things. You make promises to God, yourself and others, and you mean them. Then the power of the habit kicks in, and now you are humiliated, ashamed, angry with yourself, your foolish thinking. And you wonder, could God possibly forgive someone who does the same things over again? And this has been in my life. You know, it's in your life. It's, in all, it's, it's past, you know, there are times I don't want to stand up behind a pulpit and say, God, if the people only knew what I was thinking before I walked in here. How I wanted to punch somebody. I was angry, and I was, mad. and then I got to get up and smile, and uh, for God to love the world, <laughs> that He gave His only Son. And I wish He hadn't gave you here, because you know, uh, anyway. Uh, but, but you don't say that. You don't say that. You don't walk into the habit of of, the, of, of anger, or envy, or lust, or jealousy. You 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 got you got to deal with. You. But all of us are there, and all of us are not. We're not always honest about it. And, you know, I'm not telling you to admit it to one another. The Scripture says confess your faults. It doesn't say confess your sins to one another. You've got to talk to God about that. Now, listen, let me, let me finish you a little bit. Satan is right there saying, you phony. If you had what others had, then you would not be doing these things. Why you may as well backslide after all. You're, you're a hypocrite. If you were like pastor, you wouldn't be that way. That's why I admit to you, I'm weak. I have problems. Uh, I still struggle in certain areas. And, and we, we fight these things over and over again. And, and you'll meet people and you'll watch them on TV and you think they got it all together. My goodness, God, I know preachers. I know church folk. I even know a couple of really good sinners. Huh? And I can tell you, we all struggle. We all have issues that we got to fight through. Uh, let me share some things with you that can help you overcome. First, born-again people experience conviction. 
not condemnation. Condemnation is what you did do that you repented of. Conviction is what God's dealing with now. The very fact that your conscience is bothering you means God's not done with you, and the Holy Spirit is residing in you, convicting you. This is a good thing. When you get born again, it's not a bad thing. Everybody say good thing. It's a good thing that God, because what he's trying to do is to, is to stop you from getting destructive. Second, Jesus addressed habits. Matthew 18, 22. He told Peter to forgive 490 times for the same offense. Would he tell us to forgive over and over and he himself not do the same thing? J Jesus said, if you've got to forgive 490 times, you forgive him. In other words, make it a habit forgiving people. And if they keep offending you, evidently what they're doing is wrong too. But you've got to deal with it. I, you know, I use this phrase all the time, cover them. Co love them. Love covers a multitude of failures and sins. So if Jesus addressed that 490 times, I got to forgive John. And John was frustrating him, aggravating him, uh, tying his sandals together. I don't know what he's doing, but he's mad at him. Amen. He said, hey, 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 Peter never says it. He said, how many times I got to forgive him? The issue is when you hang out together long enough, whether you be married, couple, family, or church people, eventually you're going to do something. You're going to trespass. You're going to cross. You're going to poke somebody in the eye. You're going to stumble. Uh, do, and, and there has to be forgiveness. Has to be. So he said, you forgive him 490 times in, in, in a day. Because Peter was trying to put a stipulation on it. He said, should I forgive him seven times seven? Just 49 times. What Peter was actually saying is, I've already forgiven him 48. If you give me the green light here, I get to hit him here at 50. <laughs> right? And then Jesus ups it 70 times 7 to forgive. Third, Paul likely struggled with a habit. Paul, the great apostle, desiring to do the right, he often ended up doing the wrong. He said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. L listen to this scripture, Romans 7, 19. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. The Message Bible gives clarity to it. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to, be, not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Nick, you were saying, we're totally dependent on him and his grace. This is the bottom line. And I'm not trying to give you an out. I don't think Paul was trying to give people an out. I think we're still trying to live up, mature, grow in God. But the bottom line is, sometimes you've you got to cut some folks some slack because they do stumble, they do fall, they, they, they are having struggles. they have, they got to learn to think right. they got to start using their mind right. So he pleads, God, take it away. But God opted rather to just show him grace. Only in heaven will you no longer struggle with sin. Sometimes on earth God delivers us, but sometimes he simply shows us his grace. Heaven's going to be a great place. There won't be no more failures and sins. Right. Amen. But until then, and, and I think about Paul. Let's think about Paul for a minute. What was, I wonder what Paul's sin was. Renee, I mean, what was his sin? I mean, we, we read the scripture. We, we understand him. He talks about marriage. He, he talks about uh, sexual relationships. He talks about uh, problems in the church. And then we see his own personal testimony where he, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was out in the deep. I often wonder if all of that was to deal with his anger, his arrogance, his pride. Even Paul said uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Benjamite. He, he had this pedigree that was of high upstanding religious teaching. So I wonder if it was pride that God humbled him because he talks about humility a lot. You know, I, pride is one of the 
original sin. It is the original sin. That can get you in the most trouble. So I, I, when I'm reading this and I'm trying, not that I, I'm wanting Paul to tell me. I just want to see, Paul, what is it you struggling with too? You know, uh, Peter, was all, he was, Peter always struggled with, with foot and mouth disease. Yeah, always. He had toe jam between his teeth. He was always shoving his foot in his mouth. He was always getting in trouble. All right, let me start closing up here. Give me some aspects to become victorious over habits. First, remain faithful to God and don't give up. Well, Pastor, don't give up. Don't give up. Remain faithful. Second, do not ignore, defend, rationalize, or condone your personal failures. In other words, when you talk to God about it, straight up with him. God, I failed. This was wrong, whatever it was. You know, when the woman was caught in adultery in John chapter 8, verse 11, let me remind you, a man was also caught there. She asked the question, who condemns you? And she said, no one, sir. You remember Jesus wrote in the sand, and I believe it was the sins of all the Pharisees that were there. They all walked away and dropped their stones. And he says, who, who's here to point a finger at you now? She said, no one, sir. And she, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus had declared, go now and leave your life of sin. In other words, there was something better for you. There was a way that you could come out of this. Amen. So don't, don't ignore it. Don't defend it. Don't rationalize it. Tell God. Say, Lord, this is what I'm, I'm dealing with. Amen. I need help here. Number three, form the good habit of, going, uh, of doing the following. Pray. Pray. You know, when you pray, you're talking to God, but you also uh, renounce the habit of, of sin or failures in your own life. Tell him. Don't, well, I did that 30 years ago when I got born again. So you've been perfect ever since? <laughs> you had, some of us need to confess the gossip, the criticism, the backbone. God, I shouldn't have let that. I shouldn't have let that out. God, forgive me. Help me hold my tongue, my tongue, my tongue. Number two, repent. Father, I agree with you that this sin is in me. Help me. Help me. I, I'm weak in this area. Speak the word. Break the power of greed, lust, lying, laziness, discord, anger, envy, hatred, drunkenness, gluttonous. Amen. In Jesus' name. Speak the word. You know, I, was, I, I saw the, uh, the Forrest Gump thing, and he's sitting there on the, on, the, on the bench, and he said, life is like a box of chocolates, and he's got his box of chocolates there, and he just ate one. And I thought, how hard that is. <laughs> just eat one. <laughs> Amen. Because this... You just keep on eating it. You, just get, you don't stop. You just keep right on going. Learning how to control yourself is such a powerful thing. And lean on God's grace. Oh, grace, grace, wonderful grace. It is sufficient. And I, I say it by faith. Man, I say it by faith. You know, we, we, we struggle. We fight it. We deal with it. And, and the battle's always going to be right here in our mind. So if you can change your thinking, shift your thinking, I was just thinking. Amen. If I can deal with my habits properly and get my mind thinking right, I can turn some things around. Amen. I'm just one thought away from a success, one thought away from victory, one thought away to financial favor, better relationships with people, just learning to think the right things. Depend upon God's grace and not, not your own righteousness. Well, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make it. You know, guys, I missed riding that, that bicycle a couple of days ago, and I didn't beat myself up and go, oh, I'm just going to quit. No, I had to double up the next day. I had to press in a little bit further. I had to stay on a little bit more. And, and you know, in about probably two months from now, you're going to be saying, how's that bike riding going? And I go, I don't want to talk about it. I hope I'm still riding. That's what I'm trying to do is develop a habit to stay at it, to be healthy. You know, in life, guys, you don't have to survive. I meet too many people that are just trying to survive. Unsuccessful people focus their thinking on survival, if I could just survive. Average people focus their thinking on maintenance, maintaining. Successful people focus their thinking on progress. Where will I go from here? How can I move progress for the grass? So, uh, moving forward. How can I move forward here? And no matter where you're at in life, if you want to be successful, always be thinking about progress. Stand with me. In my life, I have determined to live on purpose. I've learned that when I pray for people, I pray for their length of days and purpose of life. What I want of you is for God to give you length of days and purpose of life. David, that's the most important thing in your life right now, sir, is length of life and purpose. For God to give you purpose in this life and length of days. I know you're going to be going to Mississippi and having surgery. I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you right now. But in all our lives, 
when you look at people. It's, if I can just get you to realize your purpose is, is so, so necessary here on this earth. Amen. To think right thoughts that lead to right actions to bring forth right accomplishments. So if your thinking shapes who you are, then it naturally follows that your potential is determined by your thinking. My potential, I, in other words, who I am, what I can make out of this life, the gifts that God's given me, I got, I got to start thinking about it. What was the 60 statement, Sam, about uh, tune out or it was a, uh, it was a drug issue. Yeah. What is it? Right. It was like shutting your brain down and just go do whatever you want to do. Well, that you saw what happened to that generation. Amen. We need, I know, we, we need help, though. We, need, we sure need, we need a little help. Say, so we all put your hands on David. Father, in the name of Jesus, we send David forth to Mississippi. God, we pray that those family would just gather around him. They would love on him, nurture him, strengthen him. God, we pray that against this pain in the gallbladder, that God, we know you can heal that. He get to Mississippi, God, and that thing already be well. So, God, we stand and believe in God in Jesus' name that you take care of him. You give him length of days and purpose in this life. I thank you for this house, Lord. I thank you for your word. And I was just thinking, what a wonderful God you are. What a wonderful God you are. You're a good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys and those watching online. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday. You want to tell somebody that Ken Holloway is going to be here.